And all of this happening as the Great New York State Fair is set to open this Friday. And hundreds of thousands of people are expected to go, many of them looking to hit the midway. But will rides be COVID-19 safe? CBS 5's Abby Buttacavoli is live from the fairgrounds with us tonight. Abby? Amanda, the company that owns and operates these rides here on the Midway is Wade's Shows. The Michigan-based company has laid out several COVID-19 protocols to keep people on the rides and germs off. Preparations are underway on the Midway for the great New York State Fair kicking off at the end of this week. Rides have arrived and with them, new COVID-19 protocols. They will get sanitized on a regular basis. Um, if not between uses, you know, there will be hand sanitizer out there. You can come and, and feel safe on the Midway. The, the carnival takes it seriously. We take it seriously. This clip from a Wade Show's safety video displays what protocols might look like. Cleaning rides using a special sanitizing solution, which Wade says works up to 28 days. Frequent cleaning of rides between uses, offering touchless hand sanitizers around the Midway, and spacing out rides, people on them, and lines. Tickets and ride passes can be purchased through a cell phone app or kiosk to limit face-to-face -face interactions. Game equipment will also be wiped down after use and prizes will be cleaned and quarantined before getting a new home. Employees will have temperatures checked before each shift and will be required to wear a mask or a face covering at all times. I asked Waffner if he thinks that's enough to keep people safe. I don't think rides in my mind are going to be any bigger of a concern than anything else we do on the fairgrounds, number one. And, you know, sure, you can point to, to, to fairs and probably music festivals and amphitheaters as places where people congregate and there are probably COVID uh, positive tests that come out of that. It's true of everywhere else in life. You just don't hear of it. I mean, you go to Wegmans, you stand a similar chance of getting COVID than you do anywhere. Now, a month ago, Wade Shows hosted rides at the Delaware State Fair. Positive cases were going up there, but the positivity rate grew from 2.5% to 3.5% during the week of the fair. Today, Officer Brandon Hanks officially filed his lawsuit against the Syracuse Police Department for $33 million. The four-year officer says he was denied a position on a special task force because his fellow officers accused him of being a drug dealer and a gangbanger. The police department also released a memo showing a deputy chief who Hanks and his lawyer call racist was supporting Hanks for that very assignment. Our Melanie Johnson has investigated these developments for the last two weeks and brings us both sides of the story. Stradale must go. The chants were loud and clear in front of City Hall Monday afternoon. Stradale must go. We want him to go now. 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 A reference to Syracuse Deputy Police Chief Richard Trudell. A new defendant named in Officer Brandon Hanks' $33 million lawsuit alleging racial discrimination, harassment, and retaliation from his commanders. God put me here for a reason, so that's what I'm here to do. So everything that was done in the dark, if they don't want to bring it to light, I'm here to turn the lights on. I sat down with the four-year officer who started his legal fight when he was denied a 30-day assignment on the gang task force. What they did was racist, it was harassing, and was discriminatory. Memos from the lawsuit show SPD officers accusing Hanks of being a gangbanger, drug dealer, and had a problem with him listening to rap music on duty. You overheard rap music playing in a video, and you can hear the N-word being played in the background, and I get a written reprimand, but person A has been since promoted to a deputy chief, okay, in charge of, in charge of other officers underneath him, including African Americans. In the lengthy federal lawsuit filed Monday, Hanks is calling for Deputy Chief Trudell to be removed from the department. Part of Hanks' lawsuit references this 2014 deposition of Deputy Chief Richard Trudell. He was asked under oath if he ever used the N-word, racial slurs against Hispanics, or derogatory terms for women, specifically two words beginning with the letter B. Trudell responded to our request for more information in an interview last week while he was out of state for training. I have used derogatory terms as a young child, as a teenager growing up. Um, I'm not proud of that. I am ashamed of it. I am sorry for that. But as I became more educated, like I said, I came from Canton. As I became more educated, went to college, um, became um, more exposed to the world, understanding, to your point, just how hurtful those words are. 
Trudell was consistent in repeating that he used those racial slurs 40 years ago as a teenager and never while he was a Syracuse police officer. He said the deposition prevented him from providing context for his honest answers. I was never given an opportunity to provide context to my answers. Um, if you read the whole deposition, um, the plaintiff's attorney was asking me questions. I never had the ability to expound on them. And as soon as I was done answering, the plaintiff's attorney ceased the deposition, stopped it. So I could never give any context. Since this deposition seven years ago, Trudeau has been promoted twice by two black chiefs, former Chief Frank Fowler and current Chief Kenton Buckner. 100% I stand, beside, stand uh, behind my decision to promote uh, Chief Trudell. Do I believe Jeff B. Trudell in his context of, of when and where he's used the word? Of course I do, uh, because if I didn't believe that, I would not have recommended him uh, to, to be a deputy chief. My actions as a child and a young teenager does not define me as an adult and as the professional I am today. Hanks and his lawyers aren't buying the chief and deputy chief's explanations and intend to expose what they believe is a culture problem within SPD. They believe they can prove Trudell has used this language more recently. Absolutely he has. Absolutely he has. And that, again, is a part of me turning the lights on because we're going to find out. It breaks my heart to even see this stuff. Like, so this department knew about this? And this guy has been promoted? Hanks tells me after this, he no longer sees a future in law enforcement. I would be a hypocrite telling some of these young kids, listen, you got to be a police officer, man. It's rewarding. It's a great job. You can meet so many people and do so many. How, when I got people in my own department stabbing me in my back? COVID-19 hospitalizations continue to surge. The state is stepping in once again, imposing its latest requirement, mandatory vaccinations for all health care workers. Good evening, I'm Matt Mulcahy. Governor Cuomo announcing the new mandate today. Any health care worker who has not yet received the vaccine has until September 27th. This comes as hospitalizations continue to surge across central New York. Our Tony Black is live in Syracuse, talking with central New York health care workers tonight. Tony? Matt, 75% of all New York hospital workers have completed their COVID-19 vaccination series. Now, a new mandate from the state today hopes to increase that number as hospitals see an increase in people needing their help. Obviously, the vaccine is the best tool we have to try to curb the surge that we're seeing in the infection. New York healthcare workers will now be required to get vaccinated against COVID-19, including hospitals and nursing homes, under a new mandate from the governor in his final days of office. We applaud the idea of being able to get more people vaccinated. Dr. Michael Scalzone with Guthrie Cortland says there are a couple of ways to get the remaining workers vaccinated. He says the mandate will likely push those on the edge to do it. There's some that we continue to just uh, increase education. It's really one-on-one. -on -one. Try to understand what people's hesitations are. Almost 90% of staff are fully vaccinated at Guthrie Cortland and Upstate University. Oneida Health and Rome Memorial both closer to 70%. Roughly 80% at Auburn Community, St. Joseph's, Oswego Health, Kraus and Cayuga Medical Center. The New York State Nurses Association said Monday they understand the need to do more to keep communities safe, but say, quote, hospitals must also ensure that new mandates do not contribute to already problematic staffing shortages. Are you guys concerned about losing workers? Well, we are concerned. As you can imagine, our hospitals, like many across the country, are struggling with staffing. It's not just hospitals. The mandate applies to nursing homes, too, where we know COVID can spread fast and is very deadly. Groups working with senior care say this mandate is not a surprise, saying it's a step in the right direction. I think if you work in senior health care, you do have to put the needs of the vulnerable population in the forefront. Hospitals and long-term care facilities say the messaging remains. The vaccine is a key tool to ending this pandemic. It's been shown very clearly that this vaccine does protect against the Delta variant and that it dramatically decreases the risk of hospitalization of serious illness. Healthcare workers have until September 27th to get vaccinated. That is six weeks from now. There are exemptions like certain religious or medical reasons.